Thank you very much for that introduction. So um, conference organizers, as the name implies, are very organized people. So, you know, six, eight weeks ago, they asked me what I was going to talk about today. And I was like, here, this is what I'll talk about. There's going to be lots of opportunities that I can talk about. And then the last couple weeks happened, and I was like, eh, we need to talk about something completely different. So now I'm just talking about how we're going to, what I think is happening in the next little while what I'm doing about it, what the options are for doing about it, and uh, what's most important, what I think is happening on the other side of it, it being this storm that we're in. So now instead of all of those particular things that I had listed in the agenda, I'm talking about we just gotta get through this. Now I don't wanna linger on any of these particular points for too long because we've talked about, I'm sure there has been lots of discussion about these topics over the last two days, but I do think context matters. And so we've been talking about inflation for like a year, but until Q1, no one actually acted like it existed. Um, the thing that changed in Q1 was that the numbers got extreme, right? 7.4% inflation steals 40% of your purchasing power in 10 years. That's, that's an unacceptable level, especially then when Russia pours fuel on the fire and the need to fight inflation became completely undeniable, right? That's what changed. And you can see it developing in the heat map. I mean, that's Spain's purchasing um, PPI index. I mean, it's freaking, the numbers are next level, right? So when the, the need to fight inflation became undeniable, reality really bit down hard. And that is what we've been experiencing, as I'm sure we all realize, over the last little while. The point, the reality that hit is that there was going to be significant tightening, market reaction be damned. That's the different thing. All through 2021, everyone was like, oh yeah, inflation, they'll tighten. But the Fed put, right? They were like, everybody was sure that if the market started to slide, the Fed would step back. And that's what they did in 2018, and fair enough, that had been the playbook. But inflation got too high and the Fed put went out the window. And now everyone's like, oh, they're gonna do that. And every time Powell opens his mouth these days, it's even, hawkisher, that's a word that I just made up, um, <laughs> that he is going to just keep doing it. He doesn't care what happens to unemployment. He doesn't care what happens to the market. We need to get inflation under control. And so we've seen all of these things happen. And I'm talking about this at a resource conference because the broad markets certainly matter. The context that I think is key, and the more I talk to people over the last few days and think about this, the more I think this matters. For the last 12 years, and especially the last two years, every risky bet seemed to pay off. Every dip was a buying opportunity. And when monetary policy managed to stop the COVID crash like in its tracks, it cemented this idea that recessions could just be stopped with policy. And so risk taking actually just went wild. And we saw that, right? SPACs and tokens named after dogs and NFTs of monkeys. And I can't even, the list goes on and on, right? That was the market. And we all know that, but I'm talking about it because the shift from that is the key thing that's happening right now. The risk-taking cycle is doing a 180. Risky stuff is cratering because it went up so much and because the forces that pushed it up, one of those that I think uh, is really important is that there was really intense demand for tech products, like tangible stuff, during COVID. And there was huge, and that like, one of the stories that I love is Apple grew reliably at 3.2% year over year for like a decade. And then in 2021, it grew 33% because everybody needed an iPad so that every kid and person could be online doing their thing. That's pulling forward immense demand that now doesn't exist anymore. So the year over year comps for all kinds of tech businesses are going to look like crap this year because the demand was pulled forward. That was a really tangible thing that happened because of COVID. And at the same time, of course, there was lots of retail money that poured into the markets because there was money around, people weren't spending it on vacations, people were at home, all of the Robin Hood effects that we've talked about a lot. Those things are reversing, right? The intense tech demand was pulled forward, it's done. We're all, up, we're all filled up with tech and we're not gonna be buying anymore for a while. People are spending money elsewhere, those things are reversing. And then of course, today's big financial challenge, inflation, requires the opposite 
of the financial conditions that supported risk for the last 12 years. Yeah, we had a bit of tightening in 2016, 17, 18, but it, like, it didn't really count because the markets were actually pretty weak and blah, blah, blah. Really, for 12 years, we've had a supportive economy or a supportive monetary setup, and that's changing. And I don't need to put this up here. We've seen this. It's pretty in intense what's gone on over the last little while. 14% of global financial wealth, that's excluding non-financial wealth like housing. And I think it is good to put that in a bit of context that, you know, the 20, 2008 crisis was a 19% decline. So like this has been big. What matters of course is what's next. Well, <clears throat> I wish I could stand up here and say that you should go out and buy all kinds of stocks today, especially commodity stocks, because it's going up tomorrow, but that's not what I think. I think we certainly have some uncertainty. We definitely have uncertainty ahead. How that uncertainty plays out, I don't know. Um, but I think the best case scenario is just like a slog from here until we get some certainty. And the certainty that we need is whether tightening stops inflation. Inflation is the problem. Tightening will continue. Powell has made it very clear that tightening will continue until inflation is coming down. We need to see that happening. Um, and that's going to take some time, right? It takes a while for a freighter to turn around. In the meantime, I don't think there's going to be much reason for markets to rally. Inflation's not going to go away. Tech's going to struggle. The bond market is not going to support growth stocks. Risk tolerance is tanking, as I've said. At the same time, there is some pretty good strength out there, right? Unemployment is low. That matters. US GDP, I mean, 70% of it is consumer spending. If people know that they, if people have confidence that they can stay employed, they generally will keep spending money. So that matters. So the fact that unemployment is low, that matters. Household wealth is high. The cratering stock market is impacting that on a daily basis. But nonetheless, there is pretty good household wealth out there. A strong US dollar is buffering inflation somewhat, for better or worse. So there is reason to believe that the soft landing that the Fed is trying to engineer is possible, but we shall see. The worser options, I'm going to keep using really good English here, are um, months of sort of sliding markets until inflation tames, but in a growth persisting sort of environment. That would actually, that's about not that different than the previous option I outlined. The two options that are worse than that, and I don't know whether bad or badder should be, which order they should actually go in here. One is that markets continue to slide and inflation doesn't go away. More tightening chokes growth and we end up in a stagflationary environment. Or that tightening works too well and we end up in an actual recession with a very sharp crash. Those are more dramatic. Stagflation sh probably should be in the, the baddest category because it is the most persistent negative um, outcome that we could come to. But these options are absolutely on the table, which is why I'm not buying any stocks today. I'm still here and I'm looking for opportunities because I think once we get through whatever this is, I think the opportunity on the other side in commodities is going to be quite dramatic, but we do need to get through this. And I don't think it's gonna get better tomorrow, but I want to know what I want to own coming out the other side and figure out as we go ahead <clears throat> how I'm gonna enter into those positions or add to them or, or whatever it might be. A few other comments about destabilizers as we go through this what's gonna happen process. Retail traders, the ones, the Robin Hooders, if that word, if that's the correct characterization, are still largely in the market, which is a bit surprising. If or when they, the Robin Hood Reddit crowd, sort of decides that they really need to pack up and leave, that could have another significant downside effect. And, and it may well be close because the gains in those retail favorite stocks since COVID are basically gone. And then there's the food insecurity side of things. And this could be a talk in and of itself. Um, it, it's been w largely or widely spoken of um, about how, uh, you know, Russia and Ukraine's wheat production, that in itself is a significant uh, loss to the market. Uh, but at the same time, we have droughts and floods that are threatening crops in other places. The, the initial wheat price spike from the Russian invasion moderated, but left prices at a double, which is pretty dramatic. And so, you know, remember what 
food insecurity in Egypt in 2014 led to, these things are very much on the table. It doesn't help that Russia produces a huge amount of the world's fertilizer components as well, and those prices have gone through the roof. And when farmers can't afford fertilizer, then their productivity per acre goes down, and so that adds to the food insecurity issues. I am no, by no means an expert on these sorts of things, but food insecurity is a very powerful force, and so that is a destabilizer that is very much on the table that will play into whatever this is. So these are things that I want to pay attention to as I try and understand which of the bad, badder, and baddest <laughs> scenarios we are ending up in. I did mention that it is possible, a soft landing might be possible. And I say that because of those things that I mentioned, right? High household wealth and low unemployment, which gives job confidence, they do cushion the economy. The, the glass half empty perspective is that they cushion the economy until they don't. And you know, low unemployment just gives the Fed room to um, tighten because they can, we can handle better, we can handle more unemployment than 3.6%, right? You, you, there, there is a glass half empty and a glass half full uh, way of looking at these things. Um, so you can see in the chart on the right there, the top right, that's consumer, um, that's, that's buying condition sentiment. It's definitely not looking great. So, you know, there, there's trouble in the waters. Um, but we shall see. I, I, the jury is still very much out on where we're going to land. I'm not optimistic, I, but I don't know if we're going to necessarily end up in a, in a full recession. And in terms of the whole risk sentiment, I would, if I could choose, I would prefer that we just sort of ground lower from here and then be, and no, without ending up in a sharp crash, because we've had that sharp crash playbook a few times over the last uh, decade and a half, and what does everybody do in a sharp crash now? They buy, and it re it, I think there would be a good likelihood that a sharp crash would reignite risk-taking sentiment, which I don't think would be helpful, certainly for the commodity sector, but also sort of fundamentally going forward. What I think would be helpful is for investor sentiment to shift from risk and growth to value where it hasn't been for a decade, really. And that would help commodities, which are very much a value argument because of the green energy revolution, creating insufficiencies across the metal space. Um, and also from a just stability for the markets perspective going forward. What I want arguably doesn't matter, but that's what I would choose if I, if I were uh, given the crystal ball. Regardless of what happens, we're going lower from here. Gold does love when things go down. I mean, gold loves a crash most of all, but loves when things go down. Jordan Royburn is a great technical analyst in the gold space, and so I've stolen this quote from him, and he just points out how reliably 20% or more declines in the stock market have precipitated or led us into rallies in the gold space. So I think that's a pattern that has repeated itself enough that it's worth paying attention to. And when I talk about that value um, versus growth, the risk sentiment part of this thought process, it really is all about relative appeal. And I think we can look back to get an example of that. So from COVID until the end of 2021, Gold, so gold-backed ETF, saw $23 billion in inflows because that was safe haven buying. People wanted to have a security blanket. But at the same time, you know, monkey-themed NFTs were still flying off the shelves, so they didn't buy gold stocks. They got their safe haven by owning some exposure to gold as a metal, but in their portfolio, they just kept doing the same, which is why gold stocks over that same time frame, saw a billion dollars in outflows, right? It seems like it shouldn't be, but that's what it was. And it's because nobody wanted value, everybody wanted growth, 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 risk, risk, risk. So what I'm most curious about as we get through this next four, six, eight months is what happens generally to investor risk sentiment. If investor risk sentiment actually turns to value, then I think commodities will be incredibly well set up because the green energy revolution is undeniable. It is very much happening. It's a paradigm shift in demand for metals and there's insufficient supply for a lot of those metals going forward. 
I mean, no amount of capital, no amount of capital can create enough new nickel mines for two years down the road for when they're needed, right? And you know, our co we don't have enough copper. We also definitely don't have enough uranium. Um, the fundamentals for the commodity space as a whole are incredibly strong. That's why metal prices have done well in the last two years, but because of that whole risk sentiment factor, the equities unfortunately haven't had as much of a, haven't had as much fun, um, which for those of us in the room, we uh, probably felt uh, all too well. <clears throat> but if we come out of this with at least some shift towards an interest in value, with some interest in buying, um, it, it, some shift away from the speculative, the risky, and more into the fundamental, then I think copper and nickel coal and uranium, I think, are going to do incredibly well coming out of this. I mean, I, I, I'm a big uranium bull. One parallel or one descriptor that I like to put out there is that, you know, if oil is doing well, then, you know, investors can choose from thousands. I mean, tens of thousands of, of options out there to get exposure to a rising oil price, right? There's no shortage. When investors turn to uranium, are there even 70 choices? There's probably le legitimately 50, 40 stocks that they can buy or funds that they can buy to really have exposure to uranium. That's the fire hose effect. And that is why you get re returns in uranium markets like the ones on that chart. I mean, Cameco is the one at the bottom that only gave 327. That's like, you know... The, the, the most boring of the uranium stocks, and then the more exciting ones, so to speak, do insanely well. And it's the fire hose effect. It's because there's just so many investors trying to crowd into an opportunity, and there's so few options for them to, to buy. Um, and the, I mean, I could, I could have stood up here and talked about uranium for 20 minutes. If anyone wants to talk about uranium more, I'm happy to chat afterwards, but the, the fundamentals there, I think, are very strong. Okay, so what's the approach from here? I mean, a, a four weeks ago, which was, I felt, too late, but still, I'm glad I did it. I certainly raised some cash and reduced some exposure because my main motivation there was, okay, I think things are going to get worse. I am bullish on metals in the medium term, so I want to come out of this storm strongly positioned for that that next thing. And so I just wanted to make sure that I had cash that I could do. I wanted to raise cash to have it to deploy into something, whatever I thought was the bottom-ish. Um, I certainly kept a bunch of stocks, um, exploration stocks or development stocks that I thought had milestones pending with significant potential for positive impact, uh, royalty companies because I just hold them through, and stocks that are my exposure to uranium and fertilizer because I think they have the potential to perform through this or to be insulated from this storm to some extent. Um, and then I sold others to raise cash. And th that approach made sense for me because, like I say, I'm strongly bullish on this sector in the medium to long term and because I like to trade part of my portfolio to hedge holding the rest of it long. Holding through whatever comes can also make sense <clears throat> if you agree with the first point, you're bullish, but you don't like to trade. That's also a fine choice. What I think is the most important thing to do is to decide on what your medium-term conviction is. Not, it's impossible to know what's going to happen over the next six months. We are in a very strange financial and monetary moment. And so I don't think that trying to buy or sell for the moment is uh, likely to pan out well. It could but it's going to be very tough. Positioning for what happens after, I think is your odds are a lot better there. So decide how you want to be positioned for the other side of this storm, and then over the next while, make sure that you are positioned that way. Maybe you're already positioned and you're just gonna hold through, that's fine. Maybe you will increase some positions. Maybe you are largely cash and you're going to buy in. But I think it's very important to, to come at it from that approach and not let emotion, which is not fun when you open your portfolio and it is red every day, don't let emotion sell your buying and selling. Let a medium-term perspective drive your buying and selling because that's the thing that you can have some confidence in, whereas the near-term I don't think you can have much confidence in at all. At, at all. 
And of course, the, this sort of chart makes the rounds in moments of concern. Commodities would crash, are crashing, like they do when um, markets weaken. Um, I do think that gold and green metals, and green is a pretty broad term when I'm talking about metals, um, I think they will rally pretty strongly up and out of this. How the equities will perform will depend on that risk sentiment. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's all about the medium term and not trying to understand what will happen tomorrow. And that is what I have to say about that. Thank you so much for your attention and I hope you enjoy the conference.